My father died in 1967, and my mother was a widow. And the word widow had really wasn't an important word in our house until then. And suddenly the word widow became associated with other words, like the widow's pension, or a widow and three children, or a young widow. And, you know, you think that literature, it, it was free of so many things. There were so many people that could look in the mirror of literature and never see themselves. And w one of them was a widow. And I began to notice that the Irish Times would publish photographs of Mary Lavin. And for some reason, I learned that she was a widow. And in a way, she was the only public figure in these times who, who was not, say, there were a few widows in the Doyle because their husbands had been politicians, but, but a sort of public figure in her own right who, who was speaking about the, these feelings, the, 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 the strange presence of a widow in a society. And she began to write these stories, or at least I began to read these stories that she had written, which were, which, which were about the mixture of loneliness and sadness and fierce independence and an effort to survive um, in a place that was so associated with love and that was now associated with loss. And there's an extraordinary moment in the opening of the middle of the fields, which is so close to home for me, where you know, it wasn't as though my mother ever wanted to be, to be reminded of what had happened. So she hated people coming up and hugging her or going on to her about it. I mean, that was fine at the beginning. And there's a moment where, in the, in the middle of the fields in the story, that, that the woman, Vera, she just doesn't want any more of that. She wants not to remember. She wants to forget. And it's a funny little moment of truth in a story where there are many moments which really accumulates certain moments of truth. I, I think the other question is a much larger one. Um, I asked Mary Lavin once, since she had a contract with The New Yorker, um, how did she, did, did she know which story she was writing now? And how did she decide? And she was very serious about this, and it, it, it meant a lot to her that she said, if I have three stories in my head, and I usually do, the one I write is the one the New Yorker is least likely to take. In, in other words, even though she needed the money, that you don't write for money. Once you start that, you lose something. You, you hold on to your independence. And she looked at me in a very steely way, meaning that th this matters, this business, of making that choice between the three stories. And um, the, the, the other thing I think that she teaches us as, for example, as writers, is her relationship to Ireland. That even though she published her stories in The New Yorker, even though she published her books in London, even though a, her vast readership, m many of the readership was outside Ireland, she never created wild Irish characters, or she never exaggerated the sort of strangeness or weirdness of Ireland. For, for outside consumption, that she, that she wrote with sympathy and with accuracy about a group of people who, again, were almost invisible in the mirror, um, if you looked in the mirror of literature, which was the Irish, the Irish middle classes. And she described memory and grief and isolation in human terms as much as she did in Irish terms. I think stylistically also she displayed immense technical guile and a sort of tonal control, but you don't notice it. It isn't as though she set out to show you how talented she was or what sort of display she could make. And um, so in her fictional gaze, she remained steely, sympathetic, in possession of a sort of poise and wisdom. I think she remains for Irish writers, including, I should say, male writers, a sort of an exemplary figure in Irish writing. And she was more interested, you see, in character than she was really in society or in politics. It was the strangeness of the human heart that interested her. It was individuality. She was more interested in families, say, than she was in politics, and more interested in the drama around solitary figures, often widows, than in the drama, say, around Irish history or large questions about identity. And I think what matters here is the clarity of these interests and her refusal as an artist to be diverted from them that makes her work seem now totally undated and that her stories still have a sort of haunting presence. They chart the aura around small hidden dramas, provincial lives, and from her own reading of the Russians and the French literature, she knew that such limits, in fact, had created a great tradition, and she worked in that tradition. In her stories, as I said, much is dispensed with, including the large matter of um, Irish history. 
her Ireland is normalised, it's calm background, rather than, say, an alarming Ireland. But she had read enough Jane Austen to know that nations change, but people don't. Human heart doesn't, and it's the job of artists to care more about that. Thus, instead of reading her stories about loss and trauma as metaphors for something that lived outside her stories, they're best read as just taking all that for granted, the history of Irish loss, the idea of public trauma in Ireland, that this is something that's merely there in the background, that she's interested in, in how strange loss is when it, it is totally personal, how sharp and unpredictable it is, and how interesting and wayward it is when it can be reduced in this way, and how open and large it can become once trusted, as she and her art learned to trust it. Thus, Mary Lavin can shine a more intense light on character, on consciousness, on motive, in all its waywardness and ambiguity, on solitude, on need, on voice. Her characters, we have to take in the small matter of Catholicism. We take that for granted in her characters. It isn't something that she dwells on. It's in the background, it's like Ireland itself. So she removes many of the props where, which might allow us to read her characters easily. She refuses to allow us to come to know them by a simple set of signals or tensions. They live in a twilight time, not of national life, but of their own life. And their desires are numerous and require a great deal of detail to describe. Um, in this story in the middle of the fields, we see the widow and we have to work out, um, I think something very important in the story at the beginning, which I think I misread for a very long time. My misreading ended when um, I was alerted by something that um, Sinead Gleason wrote, I think in response to an introduction I wrote, saying some male writers have um, I said wasn't having a go with you, Colin. <laughs> that, um, well, I took it personally. So, so some male writers have said that, that the moment when he comes back to the house and when he wakes, he doesn't wake her, but she has to come downstairs, she isn't properly dressed, there's a whole question of her hair, which is trying to hold up like this, and yeah. then it falls down, of keeping her dressing gown closed, of what's going to be on her feet, and watching him, that, she, that he is actually intruding, and it is a sexual intrusion, and it is frightening. What Mary Lavin does, of course, is she turns that fright around as quickly as she possibly, possibly can, but, it is, but reading the story again today, just to prove I'm wrong, I just, um, that I found those sentences are clearly there. Yeah. It is intrusive. It, she is frightened, and, and it isn't nothing. It's very intrusive, and I think, I think maybe I, when I wrote that, it was around the time that we were, people were starting to have conversations about the Me Too movement, and what became very clear in the division of that conversation was that so many women... Actually, and in fact, people I know said to me, I didn't realize I had been assaulted in the past because it was something that seemed, you know, it was, it was a casual thing or something that happened to me when I was asleep or I didn't realize that that was an actual assault. On the other side of that, there were a lot of men who didn't realize that when they said, you know, things that they thought were flirtatious were actually a little bit more than that. So I think there were two sides of that story in terms of women trying to get across, this happens to all of us. It happens to very young girls, it happens to much older women, but it's been part of our lives and you will rarely find a woman who hasn't had something like this happen. And in the story, he arrives and he thinks he's being kind of chivalrous, that he's sort of looking out for it, that he's doing a nice thing, until the moment that, that he isn't when he asks for the kiss. But there is a very clear moment when, again, you say that the hair, she's barefoot, she's wondering what his wife would think, that she came down in this kind of state of disarray. But there's also the moment, when I, it's the one moment for me where you know that she's absolutely terrified, where she says that his frame fills the door. And every woman will know that feeling of looking for where the exit is. How do I get out of here? Where is the door? Do I know the code for the door? How far is the road? Where, is, where can I get a taxi? All of those things. And I think that's a big part of the story where he's, he's being almost quite gentle. He doesn't leap on her, but the fact that he's there at all when she's always said and, and that wonderful line she fears the knock on the door that idea that her fear is very very real um that line what's that wonderful line where she says the anxiety by day and the nameless fear by night these were the stones across the, the mouth of the tomb so these are things that could you know could 
or could literally consume her all the time, and she specifically asked. And I think because the setting is so specific, she's, she lives in a remote place, she lives in a, a, a house that's in a remote place, everybody around there would know there's a woman in the house and her own children, so therefore she's vulnerable, she's probably frightened. It was a, a different era, you know, probably no telephones, no mobiles, all of that stuff. And he knows this, and still, because it suits him, and because somewhere you think, did he go up there because he really wanted to talk about the grass and why didn't he go in the daytime? Did he go up there with the explicit idea of trying it on there? Because again, this is the other thing, we forget that she's still a very young woman, an attractive woman, and you know, he has decided that he's going to go up with this offer of help. But I, I find that, that the moment where you see him in the doorway is where it gets really terrifying, where you, you, you already see she's going, okay, how am I gonna get away from him? And, the duck, and then when it does happen, the moment, and it's almost kind of comic, and it's almost like, a piece of choreography, she ducks under the arm. And she's all she's thinking, if I can get out into the light, because they're in darkness, obviously, if I can get out into the light, some, the, the mood will change and he won't feel that he has the power to maybe pursue this and do something else on me. I mean, the darkness of it is really central and the setting of the, the room, and I know you're really interested in the, the detail of the, the room, but I, I, that moment where he's in the door and you, you feel it, you, you, you feel it when you read it as a woman and go, oh no. And the first time I read it, it's like reading The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, you know something really terrible is going to happen or you think it's going to happen because um, she's been so brilliant at setting it up, at, at setting up this tone of dread. And it starts in the opening paragraph. I mean, the opening line is one of my favorite opening lines of a short story ever, you know, she was islanded by the house, um, like a rock in the sea, she was islanded by fields, the heavy grass washing about the house, and the cattle wading in it as, as water. There's something kind of folk horror about that, you know, the kind of, the, the, the home becomes something sort of spooky and strange, it becomes unheimlich, you know, as, as it does in horror films. And you kind of think, lo loads of horror films are like a, you know, a, a beautiful woman on her own in a house where something terrible is going to happen. And I, I, I felt that dread all the way through it, and the dread then pivots the moment when she goes under the arm, then the mood of the, t the, t the story completely flips around. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm mm. delighted to hear you saying this because I've been thinking it all day, but mm. I wouldn't have thought it had you not said it. In other words, yeah. I read it without yeah. uh, just thinking, no, no, it's, just, it's fine. She's, she's able to handle him. Yeah. But actually, the sentences tell you otherwise. Yeah. And I, I had, she's terrified. And I had skipped over them. Yeah. So thank you very much yeah. for that. No. Um, Alice, there was something very brave about Mary Lavin in the way she confronted her own life and her own experience, and the way in which she used her own locations. In other words, the farm in County Mead, the River Boyne, the bend in the river, the house, the, the place where she, in a way, had a farm, was also a writer. It's, it's, I, I didn't know her very well. I met her a number of times, but I was amazed sometimes at how close some of the stories are to the life this must be uncanny for you, <laughs> reading this story, ha having known her. Oh, for sure. And, and every time I do read them, I kind of discover more. Um, but it's, it's, it was so interesting to pick up on what Sinead said. Um, uh, and I was thinking about it all day. I think even when I read it first, I was saying, well, he is a good guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and, well, and, and I was wishing and hoping and saying, well, I hope he doesn't do anything too bad yeah. so that I have to hate him. And, and rereading it this time, it was explosive. Mm. And when I read it this time, I, I, it's exactly like you said, Colm, it was like, he barred the door. The words are all there. And I think it exactly, it exemplifies what you said, Colm, she was so brave. And I think some of the, uh, you kind of lose that, and obviously as, as my grandmother, you kind of think, okay, she just went on with life. But she had those three children there yeah. upstairs all that time during that explosive scene. Um, and it is hard to know how much is fiction and how much is, is real life, but there's some, there's some nuggets in there that make me think it really is real life. I mean, I have not been able to go to bed any night of my life without um, plugging out every single lamp. <laughs> so, and my husband tells me this is just not a thing. Um, but you know, in, like, and, and you mentioned the money thing column, and it just reminded me, like, they were strapped. I mean, they were really strapped. And on one occasion, I know they, um, uh, grandmother won the Guggenheim Fellowship, and they get to Rome, and they decide, look, we've got all this money, we're just loaded. What we'll do now is we'll stay in the nicest hotel in Rome. And just one night, but we'll treat ourselves, it'll be fabulous. And the check's coming tomorrow. So they check into the most fancy hotel, and they have ice cream in bed, and it's just the best day. And they wake up the next morning to go get the check, and the check has not arrived. And they cannot pay for the hotel. So they have to stay another night. <laughs> and this happens for five nights, until Mary Lavin has spent the entire check and I could be wrong about this, my family's in the audience, 
they had to sleep in a tent outside Rome for three months. Oh my gosh. So she was incredibly brave. Another person would have taken a job in Arnott's and just said. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I want to um, talk to you both about her artistry. That, in other words, you get this idea that there's a widow living alone in the middle of the fields. Her children are upstairs. It is night. And um, the, the first thing you need to do then is to create a backstory for somebody. Now, the very clever thing here is not to create a backstory for the widow herself. In other words, it's enough to give us that her husband is dead and that she's alone. She doesn't go back over where they met. Um, she doesn't go back over the early aspects of their life. What she does is, it's the man who's coming to work. And it's a really local thing. So, you know, her first book is called Tales from Bechter Bridge. And there is a sense of that idea of a local story of what's told about someone and the, the man who's going to come to do the work for her. There's a story told about him, how his first wife died. And it's, it's going to sound alarming, but it actually isn't. I mean, that she died of natural causes after childbirth. But nonetheless, the idea that they were deeply in love, that there was a sort of fairy tale love between them. And that the next woman who comes as his wife, instead of being the evil stepmother, she becomes the deeply loving stepmother. So what I'm talking about is that you get a number of ideas, and each one you come to, you say, what's the cliche? What's the obvious thing? And then is there anything I can do to that to turn it? So the second woman, it is, she isn't obviously going to be his wife. It's sort of her idea almost. Um, but she's so kind to the little baby who isn't hers. And she has many other children, but she, people say she was even nicer to this one. So you get, first of all, the folktale. There was a man whose, you know, his love was deeper than love itself. Yes. And he, his wife died in the baby. And then you get, no, turn it. Make her kind. And the image we have of her, that she's quite happy. Quite happy to see, at least he says he is. Will she come in and have tea? No, no, she's quite happy sitting in the car, which is such a rural <laughs> Irish thing. No, no, she's, no, she's fine. No, no, she won't come in. Don't mind me, I'll just sit here in the dark. Yeah, don't mind her. <laughs> yeah, don't mind her, she's fine. And, um, so, that, so that the backstory you have is for two, two types of grief, one of which is so clear that it doesn't need to be described because it's written in the present tense. It's the widow now isolated in the middle of the fields, watching the night, being really... Lady Gregory has a wonderful thing about being a widow. She says, I fear the night. It's in her diaries. Yeah. That idea of fearing the night. And so you don't need to give her a backstory because her present story is so carefully described with such clarity and indeed so economically described. But the other story of the secondary character, he will have to be given more backstory. But that backstory, I mean, the story of what happened to his first wife, how he married again, is not going to be part of the plot necessarily. It's not as though they're going to discuss their, their grief together. It's just going to be another aspect of the sort of building the story naturally. So you don't know where it's going to go. And um, so just, I just I wonder if, if, if you could, both of you, just, just continue this to see, like, from your side, where's the artistry? I mean, where do you find this sort of, I suppose, where does the arrow, she talked about Mary Lavin, the story being an arrow in flight, where does the arrow make its wish, its wishing sound? I think one of the biggest things I think about in terms of the artistry of Lavin is not just what's on the page and what's included is, is what's omitted, what's not said. And part of that is, it's a very skillful thing to do, but it's also meant to engage with the reader. It's meant to make you do some of the work, so you're meant to fill in the blanks. And I thought about it along, uh, all that stuff on the first page about fearing the night, the mouth across, the, 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 the stones across the mouth, whatever it is about the different types of anxiety. I started to wonder about that, that even that might be a cliche, that you're afraid of the dark, you're afraid when you're alone in the night, all those things. And then I think there's a third thing going on, and I think what that is, is this is a woman who has got three children and she's on her own. Her life is completely hectic, probably with you know the labor, domestic labor of the house, the looking after children. So the only time when she gets is alone with her thoughts and is allowed to literally let the day fall off her is when the night comes, when the kids are asleep and she's on her own. And that's possibly when, you know, memory moves in, when she's haunted a little bit, where, where ghosts, where the, and maybe if, if it's not even ghosts of the past, it's the idea about where am I going to go now? How will I find money? How will I raise these children? Will I meet somebody else? Do I even want to meet somebody else? So the night, I think, and that's never said in the story, and I think that's a really important um, act of omission. 
And again, I think the reason why we don't get, as you say, it would have been really easy to give her the backstory or to go back over their courtship and how they met and what happened. So to flip it around onto Crossan, and to Crossan's not just one wife, but two wives, is, is a brilliant kind of slate of hand. And, and a kind of risk that a lot of writers wouldn't take, as you say, they would take the conventional and chronological and obvious path, and she doesn't do that. Um, and I think that, that there's a, she talked before about the idea of particles of, of truth, and I think that there's something, about what, particles of truth, I think she's interested in. The, it, it's like the arrow in flight. And I think a lot of what she's trying to reveal in, in, in this story is the idea that um, a, a widow, and I, I, for a long time I talked about the, you know, the stories were the widowhood stories or widow stories, and I think that can be reductive, especially we don't really talk about widower stories or you know focus on men who wrote a lot about their situation as widowers. And I think that sometimes that kind of term can be a little bit reductive. But for me, I, I find it kind of an utterly modern representation of what the, the widow might be, because you can see had it been a few years earlier, had it been earlier in the path of grief, that maybe she wouldn't have stood up to him, maybe she felt she wouldn't have been able to respond the way she did, because again, what's really unsaid, and you figure it out for yourself, it's a small town, everybody will know, and this, the fear comes up not in her saying he'll tell people she was in her, you know, her nightdress, he's afraid that she's going to tell people that he said, how about a little kiss? So the fear is then, again, it's not the, the fear is in place, the guilt and shame isn't put on her, as it often is on female characters, it's put on, put on him. He's terrified all of a sudden that the wife will find out, or people in the town will know that he's done this unspeakable thing that he has, and he says it, I've crossed the line, and that's where the kind of the fear comes from. So I think it's, it's really well done. There's also a kind of, within that as well, she inverts this idea of, you know, that he thinks he's saving her, like, I'm, co I'm coming up to fix the, you know, cut top the hair or whatever, and I'm going to come up and look after you, and he, he's some sort of saviour. And then as it turns around, when he goes on his big monologue about what's happened in his life, he says, um, uh, bit by bit, I was nipped back into a living man by a woman. So then it's flipped around that he's admitting, I've been saved by women all my life. And that's very clear by the end of the story that the woman in the story doesn't need saving, but maybe the man does, you know? So that was something that really struck me. Oh, I think in terms of artistry, um, it's it's the gamut of human um, experiences. I mean, y in this one tiny interaction, uh, she goes from speaking to him sharply to feeling silly. He goes from uh, barring the door to being pathetic. And you're talking about a number of pages. Mm. And and all the time as a reader, you just they're, they're jumping on different footing. The power is just shifting. And you just don't know where it's going to land. And I, I just think that's incredible that she's managing all of this. And that's why the, the word I used was explosive. Because we just don't know where the fire kind of is going to land and, and, and who's going to come out worse of it. But I do, I do think it's, it's interesting how um, she, she, she also does such a wonderful job of that rural voice. And as her granddaughter, I'm kind of thinking, God, did she really know about what would happen if they didn't top the land? But she really kind of shows, and what's great about it, she shows this knowledge, and it doesn't really rise he, he doesn't actually, he says, oh, I didn't know you knew that, yeah. but nothing. Because he's underestimated her. Exactly. Yeah. But it doesn't, it still isn't enough. It's still not enough to kind of, so she's, you know, she's, she's once again just shifting that balance. And even when we think, oh, she's got him now, she said, I know about the knots. It's not enough. Yeah. One of the things I was fascinated by in the story was the use of detail. Was, you know, um, First of all, the hair, the, the fact that she's upstairs and she's brushing her hair, and that now she just goes down in a hurry, and you can see the problem that if she loses this hand, her hair will come down loose. But, but the one that I like even better is the one with the plug of the lamp. Yeah. Because a switch, you're in authority. You can turn on the switch, a light comes on. With this, she has to sort of bend and curl and try and find. And that domestic thing, that, you know, a, a woman in a domestic space being at this point watched by this man, that having to move in this strange, odd way, yeah. where she's really not in control of where the plug is and how to get the thing on. Just, just that those things are what matter in stories. The moment where it turns not on something said or something thought or a piece of drama, but on a tiny little thing that allowed something else to emerge. But before it did, it also created a sort of sense of visual truth that you then sort of follow everything from that. The, the other thing is, how do you create male characters in rural Ireland? And, you know, in, in these very years, we're thinking about, well, how did Patrick Kavanagh do this in something like The Great Hunger? 
husband, Harry Flynn, in, in the plays being produced. I mean, Eugene McCabe, um, King of the Castle, and pro probably in the same few years in Philadelphia, Here I Come. You know, to, to, to try and find a middle-aged man in Irish fiction who isn't drunk or mad. <laughs> and um, so the, the, the whole point of building Crossan then is, um, well, I was talking about giving him the backstory, that you give him an earlier life which suggests, which brings in loss, which brings in a sort of kindness on his part, that he, that he was hugely in love when he was young, but he was able to rebuild his life, that he seems someone who, you know, um, she wants him to come and work for her. He is respected as a worker. So you need to build all these things very slowly, gradually, and organically to suggest that this is not going to happen, that he's coming up at night for a very good reason, because some new issue has emerged. Watching her, she, she knows business. He's, she knows how to run a farm, obviously. She, she, she knows who to ask for what. So it, isn't as, it, uh, so it isn't as though she's ever helpless. So watching someone who's in control, in control and that she's going to pay him, she's going to try and get him to tell her how much so she'll know how much to, you know, that she's in control in one way. And in another way, he's someone who's being presented as a reasonable person. He's not coming from the pub. He's not shouting threats up at her. She's not frightened by his name. And so what you want in a story is somebody um, to behave out of character. The only point of a story is if someone who's really very good does something really awful. And then you go, no, no, really awful is too cliche. Does something slightly awful. And their embarrassment, and, the, and that actually the, the whole point of the story is to get what he does and turn it and watch her almost working as, as a writer might in trying to rescue this awful little moment that he has caused and rescue it by A, getting the, the other side of him as a writer might want to do with a sentence or two and then to try and navigate the story so that he gets out of the house and how she gets him out of the house finally is by raising the small matter of his first marriage. And so he goes back to some initial set of almost good feelings so she can get him out. But there's a huge amount of sort of manipulation on her part to get this man out of her house without causing any further trouble, which she does sentence by sentence by sentence. We watch her doing it as though she were a writer with a scene trying to perfect the scene. Yeah. But I suppose what I'm saying is that what you need to do is to build and build and build levels of not just credibility for the characters, but giving them images and characteristics that they're now going to actually either abandon or use further, or suddenly for a moment not have at all. So in her loneliness, the sense of, you say, a woman, a widow, that she actually emerges as quite powerful in being able to reduce this act of, which is, uh, which is almost violent, and just bring it down and down and down, not by anything he does, but by everything she does. So she becomes yeah. the power in the room against him, but also what he does is so out of character, so unlikely. Which is, you know, so that I'm, I'm just saying that there's a huge amount of complexity around yeah. what is a single brutal moment. Yeah. The surround is much more complex than the single brutal moment. And when you think about it, the, the power in the story is all hers because it, despite what society would have predicted or indicated or expected of, of, of both genders at that time, she is the, the, the widow. She hasn't chosen what everyone would have expected her to do, like to you know, maybe find somebody else. But he did. He did the predictable thing. He got the second wife, somebody to give him more children. Some to, and, and again, how their romance starts is almost terrible. It's just like she runs the next house to get her to, to mind the baby. And it's... There's, there's, it's devoid of romance. It's, and he says it's very clear from the story that he clearly didn't, isn't really in love with her. They had a good connection, but that she wasn't the first wife. Um, and I, if to, so if you kind of contrast that, he's the one that has the more sort of abject and slightly pathetic experience of, of love and desire, where hers is like, she's still young. We don't know what's going to happen to her after the story. And she could decide to, I don't need anybody else, or I might meet somebody else. But one thing I do think about the story, just to go back to the, the details, and I think the details are so important of the, of the decor and space. I think of this story every time I read it more and more. It's like a tiny play. It's like Ibsen in a way, and that 
the, the, the sp you can see the four walls. The lighting is really important. The sense of like sound and quiet in the room is really important. All of the kind of the props, where the light is, where the switch is, where the plug is. You can see her traversing the room, where the frame of the door is. And every time I see it, I think it would always make a, it would make a brilliant tiny play because it is just two people, and it's, it, it is that fourth wall contained sort of space. It would make a, it would be. It's really theatrical, weirdly, and you know. You wouldn't think of Lava necessarily as a theatrical kind of writer, but I, I think of that as, I've always thought that would make a brilliant short film or short play. It's just, it has everything. It has all of that tension and it has, it has sadness, it has pathos. And um, there's humor. I mean, it gets kind of farcical. I mean, we go from him, all of us fearing for her and being afraid of him, and then you think this guy's a joke. You know, so yeah, it, it has everything so much. And it's hard to do that. It's hard to move between those moods and tones and atmospheres in what, eight, 10 pages. It's really difficult to do. And it's the mark of a, a, a brilliant writer. I was just going to jump in there and say, yeah. did it not make you a little bit angry though? Mm. That <laughs> generally, um, you know, that here she was again, it's her responsibility yeah. to make it okay for him. Yeah. Don't to worry. Him. And I just, I, I won't I, tell. I won't yeah. tell anyone. And, and, yeah. and the bit where she says, what would his wife think of me coming down the stairs? Yeah. And you're just thinking, here we all are, yeah. women again, yeah. taking responsibility, and, and it's all our job to make sure this ends nicely. Yeah. You know, and I really, and, and what's interesting to me is I feel like the first few times I read this, I was just thinking, great, she's going to make it end nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? And now reading it, you know, in my late 30s, I'm like, damn it, you know, yeah. kick him out, yeah. you know? And it, it, it's interesting how you can get that changed perspective. But yeah. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on the ending. I don't know if I'm yeah. jumping ahead, but I, I think there's a bit of spite there. And she's really saying, um, you thought you could forget your first wife. And so she came down and haunted you and made, made you try and kiss me to hurt the, the second wife. Yeah. And I just, I just thought, I am a miraculously spiteful kind of. Uh, but maybe you didn't take it like that. I don't know. I don't know what Colin thought. I mean, I, I, it also. I think her, her telling that story in the way she does it is also about, I know a lot of things. You, you think I'm just this, yeah. this, this gauche young, you know, young widow who doesn't know anything about anything. I've told you how I know a lot about the weeds and the plants, and I know about the gardening, and I know how it works. I know about money. I know about how men like you operate. But I think part of it is also like, I know what happened to you. I know what ha happened in this small town, and everybody knows everything, and people don't forget. So I might not say anything about what you just did now or next week or next year. That doesn't mean I won't say it at some point. And I think it's a little note of, of, of warning and a little kind of it's almost like I, I, I can I might keep my mouth shut but I might not so don't mess with me again and we'll see what happens so I, I find it kind of like that I've, I mean I think with every ending of a story you, you have to go what was the alternative so yeah. like when you come to Joyce is the dead you go well you know you could just say um, and with that he fell asleep or you know as the snow began outside he found himself more and more drowsy and soon he fell asleep <laughs> And the last two paragraphs just don't need yeah. to be written because he fell asleep. He wasn't. And then you think, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night or you wake in the morning thinking, no, no, I need one more thing. I need one more thing. What is it? And then you go, it starts. Here you think it's, it'd be so easy to end it. I'll never get rid of him, she thought desperately. Oh, what ails you? She cried impatiently. Forget it, can't you? So what ails you? Forget it, can't you? And of course, she's going to now say something to him that is really about herself and it's about loss, and it's about not recovering ever from loss. And that it actually shows that um, it's one of the classic stages of grief, a sort of anger, that can emerge under certain pressures. And anyone who's been through grief knows it, that there are moments when something small turns you. And so that we watch then another truth coming into the story, something that's been in her all along. And she actually accuses him, says something to him that he has never thought and that none of us reading the story has thought. Because she says, um, it, it was, it was um, blame her, she was the one who did it. You thought you could forget her, but see what she did to you when she got the chance. Mm -hmm. Meaning that first loss of that love, which includes, obviously it's implied a great sort of sexual connection between the two of them, that they were crazy about each other. And that was lost so suddenly that actually that is what's speaking. That is what came to the house, the ghost of that or the remnant of that. Yeah. So that in other words, she's got what looked like a tiny little story given to the man and turned it and not only accused him using it, but actually it's about her. <clears throat> it's about that no matter where she will ever go, she will bring her loss with her and that, and that can be blamed on. 
And then, of course, she's got to get a way out of the story now. And he's able to do it for her by he's was standing at the open door. You know, again, he's always standing in doors. Yeah. Standing, standing that's, in very, door. that's very this deliberate, time, I think, yeah. He didn't look back, yeah. right? She's got him. But, and he says, God rest her soul, yeah. he said, and he stepped out into the night. So in, in other words, in this, this is just one last paragraph. She turns the whole thing from a set of details that looked earlier as though they were backstory for one of the characters, actually moves to the fore and becomes... It's a strange poetic idea, isn't it? That it doesn't belong to the story. It's not part of her fright. It's not part of the sort of violence of the occasion. It's part of some strange set of psychological imperatives that she feels occurred because of loss, because of loss of a, of a partner. Yeah. So it, it is, I mean, I mean I, 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 what do you think of it? I think it's great. I think, <laughs> I, I think I didn't take notes of it at all when I read it the first few times. I just kind of thought, okay, in a fizzle. When I read it this time, albeit I had a two-year-old sticking stickers on me on a flight, and I was kind of really trying to focus, and I thought, she, she's, she's doing exactly what Sinead said. She said, I've got your number, mm -hmm. and uh, you can't outrun this. But I do think it's interesting. I really think there is a little bit of spite in it. She's saying the first wife came back from the dead and made you do this. Just following on from what you said, Colin, as well, she's kind of a writer's writer because, you know, sometimes the public think, oh, I've, heard, I've read this one. But, but if you're really interested in literature, you're kind of like, oh, this is a different take. And, this is, and I do remember being in um, a lecture hall in Trinity when I was far too young to enjoy it, maybe about seven, and we were hearing Alice Munro speak. And they said, are you happy to be here? And she said, well... I just can't believe I'm in the country of Mary Lavin. My greatest inspiration. And I mean, personally, I just think Alice Munro does this so well, the tiny scenes about a glove or, mm. you know, so to hear about her influence, not just in Ireland, I mean, really. Mm. So she is that kind of writer's writer, but yeah. you know, things like that. Maybe that's a good way to end then. Yeah. A writer's writer that is also a reader's writer. Yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.